in their 2015 book titled Mission Drift, Chris Horst and Peter Greer say that all faith-based organizations, including churches, face the danger of mission drift. Mission drift, as you might imagine, is when a group, over time, slowly or quickly, moves from their original purpose. Horst and Greer give the example of the YMCA, which was originally founded as the Young Men's Christian Association to aid in Bible-based spiritual development for young men. Today, that's not the wise mission. That's mission drift. Uh, Horst and Greer also give the example of Harvard and Yale. Harvard founded in the 1600s. Yale founded in 1701 as a school to train pastors. Uh, Today, they're more or less thoroughly secular. That's mission drift. Now, this is not just a a danger for big global organizations like the Y or major universities like Harvard or Yale. One of the sad conversations that I have in membership interviews, unfortunately, regularly for our church, is that people are coming to our congregation because either their church or sometimes an entire denomination is drifting from its mission. And that's why they're coming to us simply looking for a church that is committed to the Great Commission still. Now, I'm, I'm grateful to say that by the grace of God, I don't think our church is there. I don't think our church is drifting from its mission, but we must be on guard against mission drift. Because our our goal is not only to be faithful to our mission today, but until the Lord returns for generations, we want this body of Christ, if the Lord wills, to be true to its mission. And when the people of God don't have a clear and shared sense of identity and purpose, it leads to ineffectiveness. It leads to distraction. It can even lead to compromise. Now, if we want to prevent and guard against this, and, and we must, all of us must agree on that, if we want to prevent this, that's actually easier said than done. And here's why. Churches are made up of people. And people are flawed, they're imperfect, they're inconsistent, Church leaders, church members, we're all sinners. And we face opposition. We face the pressure of the world to secularize. We face our own flesh, our own temptations to sin, our own laziness and propensity to distraction. And then also we face the deception of the devil who would like nothing more than for us to casually drift away from what God has called us to do. So here's the solution. If this is easier said than done, here's the solution. Horst and Greer use the illustration of a frying pan on a burner. I know not all of us are cooks, but I think we all know how this works. If you put a frying pan on a burner and turn it on, it will heat up. If you take it off the burner, the heat will gradually dissipate. It won't retain the heat. If you want that pan to stay hot, you've got to put it back on the burner. And in this illustration, the frying pan is the church. The burner is what the Bible says about the identity and mission of the church. And so if we want to stay faithful to biblical identity and mission, we need to take every chance we get to put the frying pan back on the burner, so to speak. We need to, as a church, recommit here again and focus intentionally on what the Bible says about the identity and mission of the church. And that's why 1 Peter 2, 
verses 4 through 10 is a gift to us. It's the burner turned on high (laughs) that can help us recommit and re-engage with our identity and mission. So I invite you to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, you're welcome to use one of the black covered pew Bibles in the pew in front of you, and you can find 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 10, beginning on page 1014. That's page 1014. Maybe you don't know that this is the fourth week of what I expect to be a 13-week preaching series through the book of 1 Peter. And that's why I'm preaching from this passage this morning. 1 Peter is an ancient letter called an epistle, which was written to various churches in the ancient world. And the way that I've been summarizing the message of 1 Peter is this. Stand firm because your triune God saves you through suffering. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4 and reading to verse 10. As you come to Him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like spiritual stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You may be seated. This passage gives biblical answers to three questions that every person in our church should be able to answer with one voice. Three questions that every person in our church should be able to answer with one voice. Who is Jesus? Who is the church? Amen. Let's pray. (laughs) And what should the church do? So again, that's who is Jesus, who is the church, and what should the church do? So first, who is Jesus? I started this sermon talking about the mission of the church. The mission of the church. And we're going to get there. But here's our first lesson. Before Peter tells us about the mission of the church, he tells us about the identity of Jesus Christ. And that is a lesson in itself. The identity and mission of the church must be rooted in Christ. It has to be. Any secular leader in any organization will tell you that people must have a clear sense of identity and purpose if they're going to work together. That is obviously true. But the church is not just baptizing secular organizational principles because the church knows that our identity and mission 
flow out of the person of Jesus Christ and is rooted in him. So we'll get to the mission of the church, but look at verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone. A rock is, is strong, sturdy, but lifeless. Jesus is strong, sturdy, and pulsating with indestructible resurrection life. Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. In our sermon passage, you need to understand that Peter uses the Old Testament like a word bank to talk about Jesus and his people. And and I'll show you. So look at verses 6 and 7, where Peter quotes Isaiah 28, 16, and Psalm 118, 22. So two different Old Testament passages. And you see that in verses 6 and 7, the same words that Peter uses to talk about Jesus in verse 4 are right there in verses 6 and 7. You see the word stone, chosen, precious, rejected. Again, Peter takes those words from the Old Testament and applies them to Jesus. And we need to know why. Peter wants us to understand that God predicted the rejection of his son. So him being scorned by the world doesn't undermine him being the Messiah in any way. In fact, Jesus being rejected by the world proves that he was the Messiah who God said was coming all along. This matters because one of the biggest challenges every Christian and every church faces is the rejection of Jesus by the world. Rejection is a powerful thing, and the rejection of Jesus by the world trickles down into rejection of us, his people. Rejection can make us question. It can make us fearful. It can even lead to compromise, and yes, mission drift. Rejection is a powerful thing, but here's what Peter is saying. What matters isn't who the world chooses. What matters is who God chooses. And Jesus is rejected by people, but chosen by God. You know, we don't have to look for an illustration of how this should impact our lives outside of the Bible. Because I'll give you one guess which person gives us an illustration of how this should impact our lives. Peter. So let's look. Acts 4, verses 11 through 12. I'll set the context for you. In the earliest days of the church, Peter was confronted by people who wanted him to stop preaching about Jesus. So listen to what Peter said in Acts 4, 11 through 12, and listen for something. Listen to Peter reference Psalm 118, verse 22, the same Old Testament passage that he cites in verse 7 of our sermon text. Peter says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is mission faithfulness in the face of pressure to drift. And Peter is setting us an example of being able to do that because he understood what the Old Testament says about Jesus. That Jesus would be rejected by people. 
but chosen by God. And what matters is not who the world chooses. What matters is who God chooses. That's what leads to boldness and faithfulness in our mission. So who is Jesus? Rejected by people, chosen by God. Now in verses 6 through 8 of our sermon text, people go, Peter goes on to say that our response to Jesus, so he tells us who Jesus is, but then he says our response to Jesus determines our identity and purpose. Our response to Jesus determines our destiny. That's what Peter says. So, look at verse 6. Peter cites from the Old Testament, like, like he likes to do, and says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And then Peter explains the point he wants to, us to get in verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe. God has chosen Jesus, which overwhelms the world's rejection of him. So believers in him will not be embarrassed. They will receive honor for committing their lives to God's chosen Lord. But then, look in verse 7, because Peter goes on to say, but for those who do not believe. And then he cites Psalm 118, verse 22, the passage about the cornerstone, which we've referenced already. Maybe some of you remember that on Palm Sunday, I preached about Jesus telling the parable of the tenants from Luke 20. In that parable... God is represented as the Lord of a vineyard. And he rents out his vineyard to tenants who represent the Jewish religious leaders. Those tenants reject the Lord of the vineyard, and ultimately, in the parable, they murder his son. Jesus told this parable as a parable of judgment to the people who were about to fulfill it by crucifying him. And maybe some of you remember that the first thing Jesus says after he tells this parable is he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22. Because he's telling people that their rejection of him can't stop his ascending to supremacy. His ascendancy was planned by God and cannot be stopped by people. So the world's rejection of Jesus makes no impact on him being God's chosen Messiah. And Peter wants unbelievers to understand that they cannot foil or stop God's plan by rejecting Jesus. Jesus has ascended to supremacy as Lord, and we must embrace him by faith. This is why, in verse 8, Peter quotes Isaiah 8, verse 14. Then he comments on that Old Testament passage with probably the hardest words in this passage to understand. In verse 8, Peter says, They stumble." Because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. A statement like this can raise tough questions. But what we need to understand this morning is not all the answers to those questions, but why Peter says this here. Peter says this because in God's sovereignty, he controls both acceptance and rejection. God controls both belief and unbelief, which means that God's plan cannot be stopped or ruined by unbelievers. The plan of God to save cannot be pushed off course by anyone rejecting Jesus Christ. In his mysterious providence, the rejection of Jesus is only a part of the plan of God 
to save the world. So the message of Peter is clear. Jesus is the rejected but chosen cornerstone. And all people must decide either to build their lives on him and enjoy the eternal honor of life in him. Or they can reject him and trip over him to their eternal death. Jesus is the rejected but chosen Lord. And our response to him determines our identity and purpose. I said that there were three questions that I wanted to share with you. The first is who is Jesus? But there's a second. Who is the church? Who is the church? I've talked a lot about mission drift. But churches must also be concerned about identity drift. Forgetting who we are as a people. As I've already said, both our purpose and identity as a church has to be rooted in Jesus Christ. If a church tries to have a clear sense of identity and purpose without basing it in Jesus Christ, then you know what they're like? They're like a kid trying to fly a kite without attaching the kite to the string. (laughs) If you do that, the kite the identity and purpose, it might soar. (laughs) But where's it going to land? There's no control. It's untethered. It's wild and unpredictable. So our identity and purpose can't just be clear. It must be rooted in Jesus if we want to be faithful. And I share that with you because look at verse 5. Peter calls Christians living stones. And what's amazing about that is because that's what Peter calls Jesus in verse 4. Peter is saying that through the resurrection of Jesus, his people participate in his resurrection life and experience the power of his resurrection. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, It says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In verse 4, in this passage, Peter just piles up phrases about the identity of the church. And and look at verse 4, because he goes on to say, Christians are being built up as a spiritual house. In the Old Testament, God was worshipped in the temple. But Peter is saying that the people of God are the new temple. Christians, the body of Christ, is where God is worshipped. Also in verse 4, Peter goes on to say that Christians are being built into a holy priesthood. In the Old Testament, priests were full-time worshipers, full-time ministers, full-time interceders. Peter is saying that's now the church. The church is a community of full-time worshipers of God. Now, skip down to verse 9, because when I said that Peter piles up phrases about the identity of the church, I mean it. I mean, look at him go. Look at verse 9. Peter is using the Old Testament like a word bank again. And Peter says, but you are a chosen race. Again, what's amazing about this is that's the same word, chosen, that Peter uses to talk about Jesus. You know, somebody being chosen or rejected 
has the power to define their life. And Peter is saying that in Christ, his people are chosen like God chooses his son. Amazing. In verse 9, Peter goes on to say, a royal priesthood. In the words of Exodus 19, verse 6, God intended for Israel to be a kingdom of priests. And Christians now fulfill that calling. You'll miss the power of these phrases if you don't understand that these aren't mere words, but these are titles that come with privileges and responsibilities. Peter is saying that Christians all have the privilege and responsibility of worshiping God, ministering on his behalf, interceding with him for others. In verse 9, Peter says, a holy nation. Nations today are defined by geographic borders, but Peter says that the people of God are defined not by geography, but by being different than the world in all the right ways. You can find a Christian when you find someone who's separated themselves from sin and dedicated themselves to God. And God is building a nation out of those people from all around the world. And then in verse 9, Peter says, a people for his own possession. In the words of Exodus 19, verse 5, you shall be my treasured possession. What is the thing you own that matters most to you? God looks at his people like that, but infinitely more. You know, I asked Trevin to read that difficult passage from Hosea 1 and 2 earlier in the service for a reason. That passage describes how God commanded the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer. God told Hosea in advance that she was going to be unfaithful to him, but God commanded Hosea to marry Gomer anyway. And then God gave names to her three children, which represented spiritual truth about Israel, names that meant judgment, names that meant no mercy, and names that meant not my people. This is a shocking passage. But what's most shocking is that as Trevin read, God goes on to say that one day he would turn their names from judgment into blessing. From no mercy into mercy. And from not my people into his people. This passage is so shocking because we can't comprehend the depths of our unfaithfulness to God and the permanent, unflinching nature of his love for his people. Willing to make any sacrifice. Willing to save at any cost. And if you look at verse 10 of our sermon text, he says this to us. Once you were not a people. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. And with those words, the whole story of Hosea comes crashing in. Because God is saying, your spiritual unfaithfulness is just as bad. And my love is just as strong. And it's all coming true for you. You know, what we believe about who we are, it determines our identity, it controls our destiny. You know, the world might say to us that the church is a bunch of rejects, but God says you are 
a chosen race. The world might say to Christians, you're not doing anything to help the world. And if you really wanted to make a difference, you would change your mission. But God says, you are a royal priesthood. The world might say that Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. And a lot of times they're right. But listen to what God says. You are a holy nation. The world might say that Christians are lost in the world. But God says, you are a people for his own possession. You know, I've been talking about identity, and a lot of you are probably hearing everything that I've been saying in terms of I, singular to you. And that's how we are. We're modern Americans. We're individualistic. But did you notice that in the sermon text, it's not I, it's we. God is not saying who you are individually as much as he's saying who we are together. And as much as modern people like me don't like it, This means that our individual identity has to take its place in the community identity of the church. Because God is not just making individual Christians, although he is, but he's gathering them into a people. And that's his plan to save the world. So I would challenge you, if you're you're a Christian who's been living on the margins of the church, maybe reluctant to join a church, I I would encourage you that I think if you want to experience the full power of this identity in your life, it's only going to happen when the I becomes a we in your life. A Christian who is living on the margins of the church shouldn't be surprised when they don't experience being a holy priesthood. Because that only happens when the people of God covenant together and live as his people in the world. So I've answered two questions. Who is Jesus and who is the church? But there's a third and final question that every person in our church should be able to answer with one voice. And that is, what should the church do? I told you I was going to get to mission. Here we are. Over the years, our church has had various mission statements. Some of you could quote probably all of them from memory. On the wall of our fellowship hall, we used to have the words, saved by grace, seeking to live the gospel, shining the light of Jesus. On your way out, if you look outside the auditorium, there's a sign on the way into our auditorium that has another previous mission statement. We glorify God by living as a redeemed community who proclaims the gospel. It's a great mission statement. I just finished teaching Exploring Membership where I shared the current mission of our church, and I'm going to call on one of the people in the class now, and they're going to be able to tell you what it is. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) So this will be a reminder for all of us, including him. The, the mission statement we currently use is a community of believers in Jesus Christ seeking to make disciples for him in Floyd County and among all peoples. Churches have mission statements for an obvious reason, to clarify their goal, to give people something to rally and unify behind. But the reason that a church may change mission statements over time or really not even use them that much is because the Bible has multiple inspired mission statements for the church. And we have two of these inspired mission statements in our passage. So the first is in verse 5. Peter says, "...to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ." In the Old Testament priests offered all kinds of sacrifices as part of the act of worshiping 
God. And Peter is saying, that is now the responsibility of the church. The sacrifices that we offer are not animals or produce like they did in the Old Testament, but listen to Romans 12, verse 1. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Our sacrifices are obedient living, speech that confesses Jesus as Lord. So, what is the mission of the church? Well, based on verse 5, it's worship. But look at verse 9, because there's a second inspired mission statement. Peter says, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God is excellent, and the world needs to know. God has changed our reality from darkness to light, and the world needs to know. And that's why the church exists, for proclamation. So if we were going to put these two inspired mission statements together, we would say that the mission of the church is worshipful proclamation. What this means is that when we gather as a church to worship, like we are in this moment, this is not a means to an end. This is the goal. This is it. We are not just preparing to be the church. We are not just learning about what the church is. We are being the church. The church exists to worshipfully proclaim God in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, we are on mission. Now, let's not get confused. What happens in our worship service spills over into the rest of our lives. As we worship God with our families and friends and in private, as we live in sacrificial love in the world and seek to do good to others, But this is where it happens. The mission of the church is worshipful proclamation in a church that wants to stay true to its mission. Not drift. Will never shift from that. You know, many people believe that churches are simply social clubs. Many people believe that churches are basically nonprofit organizations maybe community organizations. A lot of people, especially in an election year, think that churches are political associations. A lot of people think that churches are therapy centers or even, sadly, spiritual businesses, basically. And if we were a social club, our mission would be different. It would be making friendships. If we were a nonprofit, Our goal would be to make a difference. If we were a community organization, we would gauge our success by whether or not all of you are good citizens. If we were a political association, then our job would be to rally to the polls. If we were a therapy center, our job would be to fix people's problems. And if we were a spiritual business then our goal would be to make spiritual customers. But that's not what we are. We're living stones. We're being built up as a spiritual house. We're a holy priesthood. We're a chosen race, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And we exist for worshipful proclamation. 
And may that be true in this generation and all the ones to come. And may we pray for that. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are saying to yourself, the church that Peter describes is not the church I see. And you're right. The church is full of imperfect people who need to grow together in biblical identity and purpose. So if you're thinking that, look at verse 5. Because Peter says, the church is being built up. So if you feel like the church is under construction, that's what Peter tells you to expect. And you might need to wear a hard hat sometimes in the life of the church so that you don't get hurt. But here's what's important. The verb being built up in verse 5 is grammatically passive because God is the builder. One of my friends uh, works for a construction company. And Emily and I have spent some time with her at some of her job sites. And she has this amazing ability because of her training and experience where she can walk around on a concrete foundation that will one day be a beautiful home. And before it's, it's framed, before anything else is put in, she can describe to you in vivid detail what that house will one day look like. She can go and, and stand on a piece of concrete and say, this will be the kitchen. You know, you know this will be the great room. You, you know, these, this will be one of the bedrooms. She has the vision to see what it's becoming. I, I think that a mature Christian is like that. A, a mature Christian can, can stand in the church even when it feels like you're standing on a concrete piece that's going to be a house one day. And a mature Christian has the vision to see not only who the church is, but who she's going to be. So when you see all the ways that the church is falling short, don't be discouraged. Because God is building his church. Don't be discouraged. Pray and ask him to finish the work. Because God is the builder, we can't simply will ourselves to be the church that he wants us to be. We can't simply strategize ourselves into being the church that he wants us to be. We have to submit ourselves to his word. We have to pray. And by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to join him in his work. Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you, and we ask that you will reveal to us, as a church and individuals, the ways that we're falling short of who you've created us to be and what you want us to do. And then we ask that you would build our church. We ask that you would guard us from drifting from Christ, drifting from our identity, drifting from our mission. And as the Lord of the future, we ask that you would do that not only today, but for all of our tomorrows until the return of your Son. We ask this in his name. Amen.